Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. This last chapter, in a special sense, is a whole series of exhortations, and it can be viewed in various ways. It's been described as a loose string of an assortment of practical and social and religious exhortations. Someone else says the Apostle's papyrus is coming to an end, and he therefore issues a few staccato pieces of counsel to the Hebrew Christians, because he's coming to the end of the page, as it were. But I think it's possible to view this 13th chapter in a rather different way. And I want to suggest that to you this evening as the framework in which we will study the chapter together. From the beginning of chapter 12, the apostle has been describing the Christian life as a race to be run. And we have frequently reminded ourselves of that metaphor that he uses, a race which is rather like a marathon than a sprint, where the apostle is speaking to us of the need to persevere in the running of this race with our eyes fixed upon Jesus. This is how we are to run the Christian race, our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Now, it seems to me that these practical exhortations in chapter 13 can really be seen as flowing out of that idea of running the Christian race. Because when you are running an ordinary race in our terms and in the terms in which the apostle was obviously thinking of in the Greek games, a course is marked out for you when you are running the race. There are guidelines, in other words, printed or painted on the ground and guide posts to show you exactly the limits within which the race is to be run. In other words, it's not just a case of running in any way or in any path. This race has specifically to be run within certain guidelines that are laid down. Now, there is a sense in which these practical verses in chapter 13 are the guidelines the apostle gives us for running the race. There is nothing vague, you see, about the directions for running the Christian race. As we persevere in godliness, as we run with our eyes upon Jesus, there is nothing vague about the direction that we are to run in. There are guidelines that are set down for us in the most practical terms possible. And here in chapter 13, you get 10 of these from verse 1 to verse 17. And between this evening and next Wednesday evening, I hope we may be able to look at all of them and then to conclude the letter at the end of chapter 13 with the benediction which the apostle prays for the Hebrew Christians to whom he writes. But I want us to look this evening at probably the first half of these 10 practical guidelines for running the race. So here we are taking all this great doctrine that the apostle has taught us, taking up this general exhortation to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, and now rooting it in practical counsel for practical situations in daily life. And so often the epistles do this in the New Testament. They take up the great doctrinal teaching and then apply it to the most practical, down-to-earth, everyday situation. Now the first of these guidelines in verse 1, do you notice, is the exercise of brotherly love. That is, if we are to run this race in the right way, we have to exercise brotherly brotherly love for those who are running it with us. Now, that is not at all the atmosphere, of course, in which either modern games or the Greek games were run. They were run with rivalry and competitiveness and sometimes a fierce envy and a spirit of bitterness between the competitors. 
But the Christian race, the apostle is saying, is to be run with the kind of brotherly love which will encourage one another on as we seek to persevere in this Christian race. The whole atmosphere that will pervade it is not a selfish concern for myself, but a brotherly burden for those who are running the race with me, that they too may persevere, that they may get through the difficult patches of the race, that they may be going on, and that as I'm running, as it were, although it is true in one sense that I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus, one of the things that will involve is that I am caring about my brothers and sisters who are running the race with me. And that's the great contrast between the Greek games or any other kind of race. It's not every man for himself. It is every man for his brother. Now this is a very interesting thing. If you look back to Romans chapter 10, which is 12 rather, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, which is a comparable passage in many ways as Paul brings his practical exhortations at the end of the epistle to the Romans, you find the same kind of emphasis in Romans 12:10 when he urges them love one another with brotherly affection now do you notice how the idea of competitiveness is brought in in the second half of this verse outdo one another in showing honor now in the games that they would know about competitiveness was expressed in outdoing one another in seeking honor. Now the kind of competitiveness that we are to have in the Christian race is outdoing one another in showing honor. That is, I am more concerned about the honor and well-being and blessing of my brother than I am about myself. And whatever this gift of competitiveness has been given to us for. Have you ever wondered why we were given the competitive spirit? Because we all have it. Well, here is what it is for. Not that it might be consumed in myself, but that we might outdo one another in seeking to show honor and preferment and brotherly love and affection the one to the other. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, if we live this way, what a difference it would make to the way we were running the Christian race. When people are struggling and are going through a difficult patch, you see, that causes in the ordinary human race a great deal of pleasure. Look at old so-and-so, he's fallen behind. I still remember it. I was no great athlete, but I was involved in the games we used to run out in Bishop Briggs and Alan Glenn's playing fields. And I remember if somebody tripped up, there was an elation immediately came to you. It's a good man, that's great, and on you went, you know. But when you're running the Christian race, the spirit is so totally different. Or is it? Really? You know, there's a very interesting translation of 1 Corinthians 13 about love, you know, which says, love, it's Philip's translation, love is never glad when others go wrong. Love is never glad when others go wrong. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Rejoiceth not. Love is never glad when others go wrong. There is a brotherly love. Now, of course, I've often said that in biblical terms, it is not love and hatred which are the opposites, but love and self-love. And this is one of the places where it is most deeply challenged in our running the Christian race. Did you notice that phrase that we sang in our hymn, Through the Night of Doubt and Sorrow? <clears throat> Did you wonder why we sang it? Well, it's because of that phrase in it. Brother clasps the hand of brother. Can you imagine a race like that? Well, it doesn't conjure up a very obvious idea of a race, does it? But that's how the Christian race is run. Brother clasps the hand of brother and therefore encourages and urges the brother on. And the point of this exhortation, of course, 
is that this is how the Lord loves and how the Lord encourages us in the midst of the Christian race. The reason that some brothers are discouraged and cast down could be that I am so absorbed with myself and my own world and my own situation that I've let his hand go, so to speak. And I have not been running the race with brotherly love. Oh, it is such an important thing. You notice how the second guideline for running the race follows on from it in a sense. It is the exercise not now of brotherly love, but of a certain form of brotherly love in terms of Christian hospitality. Verse 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Now, the idea of hospitality is one that we need to clear a little bit in our minds. Christian hospitality in the New Testament is not just the opening of our hearts and homes to our friends and our relatives and those we like uh, and or those we like and whose company is congenial to us. And that is hospitality, of course, and that's a very lovely form of hospitality. It's a thing to be encouraged. But you see, Christian hospitality goes far beyond that. It never excludes that. And Christian hospitality ought to be concerned with the kind of love that there is amongst people that we know closely and well. But Christian hospitality is the opening of our heart and home to the stranger and to the traveler and to the friendless and the lonely and the unloved and possibly the unlovely, and that is a rather more costly ministry, isn't it? But you notice that that's what the apostle is speaking about. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And this is a ministry, as I say, that is more costly. In the New Testament, that was chiefly to strangers within the gates who were Christians, and I have little doubt that this is exactly what the Apostle is speaking about. Some of these would have been driven from their homes because of persecution or because they had been put out of their homes or because they were traveling preachers or because they were wandering, some who wandered over the face of the earth because they did have no home and they really were homeless. And it is hospitality to them particularly that the New Testament so often is speaking about. Paul speaks about this again and again. People who were addicted to hospitality. Now you see the thing about these people was that they discovered themselves without a home, without a family, without roots, without care and without love. Now where would they find that? Well the apostle says... Give yourself to this kind of hospitality. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. These would often have been people who were, just because of their loneliness, finding the race hard, you see. And here is a situation where somebody might be alone in the race or drawing back a little bit and being discouraged or having a sense of real isolation and of no one really caring. Now, the true Christian fellowship, my dear Christian friend, should be a place where somebody coming in who is a stranger feels what it is to be taken in an embrace to the hearts of God's people and given hospitality. You know what hospitality is, of course. Hospitality is an English word coming from the same word from which we get hospital. And a hospital is a place where the broken and sick are restored and strengthened and made well again. A hospital is a place where those who are in great need are taken and supplied with their needs. And what the apostle is saying is, let your fellowship be a hospital to people like that. And oh, what a 
need there is in the evangelical world for us to have that kind of fellowship? Do people really, I constantly ask myself this, do people really experience this when they come into St. George's Tron? Do they really know what it is to, to come into a place that is like a spiritual hospital? Or do they feel a little bit like people in the casualty, if the medical people will excuse me for a moment, who get told, go and sit there, you know, wait till you're called, and then you're never called. <laughs> it's a really important thing, you know. Wonderful thing to have a heart that's like a hospital where the broken and the needy are drawn and healed and made whole again. There are people like this. The Apostle Paul regards it as such an important thing that people be shown this that he actually mentions at the beginning of chapter 16 of Romans, Phoebe, our sister, a deaconess of the church at Cenchrea, that you may receive her in the Lord as befits the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a helper of many and of myself as well. He says, receive her, give her hospitality, you see. So hospitality is the opening of our hearts and of our homes to those who are strangers. And there is a quality of love about all this that um, we greatly need to cry to God to give us because it's only God who can produce this. You know, you can't really produce this artificially or organize it and say, now we will have little groups of hospitality because God creates hospitality, because God breaks open our hearts and and opens our lives and opens our fellowships and sets on fire a warmth in our spirits towards people, especially needy people or strangers. Many of you know Peter Brumby, and uh, someone was telling me this evening that they had been meeting Peter and Jean Brumby in Whitby just the other day. Stuart Anderson, I think, and uh, Peter Brumby has been here and has preached here, and God has done a work of real grace in his church, and somebody who was converted uh, in his church I met when I was there last September, and uh, it was really very interesting. Was it the September before? I've forgotten, but he was, he was talking about how he was converted, and he said um, when Peter had originally asked him, you know, how did you become a Christian? He said, oh, it was at a certain service. He said, that's very interesting. He said, now, what was it? What was the word that particularly touched you? And then, I'm sure a great mortal blow to my good brother's spirit. He said, I don't remember a word you said, Mr. Brumby. He said, uh, but I'll tell you something. He said, I have been brought up in a situation where I've really been starved of love. And I've had an insecurity all my days and a sense of hunger for true love. And when I came in here, he said, I could almost feel the arms of God's people reaching out to embrace me. And I experienced the love of Jesus flowing through them. And he said, it quite melted my heart. And that was when he started coming and when God started working and when his heart was open to Jesus. And that's hospitality. Now the apostle adds that there are so often as there always are byproducts of blessing in obedience. There are always byproducts of blessing in obedience because God is never any man's debtor. And the byproduct of blessing is in the second half of verse 2. For thereby, with exercising hospitality, some have entertained angels unawares. Doubtless he's thinking of 
Abraham in Genesis 18, don't you think? Where when Abraham, do you remember, saw, the, saw these three men coming, and he just saw three men. But we, reading from the beginning of Genesis 18, which Abraham, of course, didn't have at that time, we know that it was the Lord who was coming. The Lord drew near to him and he lifted up his eyes and he saw three men. And he said to them, won't you come? And he didn't know it was the Lord. But he welcomed them to come in. He opened his home to them and opened his heart to them. And it was God who came into his home. And what sanctifying blessing that brought with all the promises of Isaac to them. Now, oh, there is a dimension of this that is to be experienced when we have open hearts and open homes. Sometimes I think we think of the costliness of this sort of love, you know. Somebody very honestly said to me the other day, beautiful honesty, you know, I don't like the idea of my home and family being disrupted by other people. My home is my castle and I get in there and I shut the door and I have peace and quiet and that's what I want. And obviously they thought that to have a home that was open would be impoverishment. But you know, it can be the open door through which the Lord comes in a special way. And Abraham found a new dimension of spiritual experience opened up to him from that time. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. The exercise of Christian brotherly love, the exercise of Christian hospitality, and the third guideline is the exercise of Christian compassion. Verse 3, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated since you also are in the body. Now here he has in mind those who are running the race in conditions of particular difficulty and great distress and opposition. And he urges the rest of us, do not forget about them, rather remember them but remember them in a special sense. Now, I'm sure that means remember them in prayer. I have no doubt that that is what he means. But he is speaking about something rather special. He says, remember them in the sense of putting yourself inside their situation. Here are brothers who are in great need of love and compassion, and they are running the race, and some of them are in prison, and some of them are suffering ill treatment. Now, he says, when you remember them, remember them in this sense that you put yourself right inside their situation. And of course, that is just learning to be like Jesus, who is touched with the feeling of other people's infirmities, is not a remote high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but understands them, puts himself, as it were, right inside the situation. That's the glorious thing about the Lord Jesus that in whatever situation you find yourself, you know that he is able to come to you and say, my child, I understand. I know exactly what you are going through because there is not a place where we have set our foot on this Christian race, but Jesus has been there before us. Now you take that from God because it means that there is not an anguish that has touched your spirit but Jesus has borne it. He has become acquainted with our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. And he has been tested in all points as we are. But you know, we are to be like him in this, that we are to stand inside the experience of those who are suffering. That is what the apostle means when he says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. The secret of it is, of course, that there is that close bond of faith and love which binds lives together in Christ. 
There is a human analogy, isn't there, in the kind of bond that binds a parent and child. And when the child is suffering, do you know sometimes how you almost feel the anguish? There is a, perhaps a closer analogy in identical twins. I have quite a number of friends who are identical twins. And uh, one of them, I remember, confided in me that he found it impossible to dissociate himself from what was happening to his brother. Even though he was in another part of the world altogether, his brother was in hospital and going through surgery, and when his brother was on the operating table, he began to experience what it was to have inward anguish. He said, I was actually feeling the pain with him. Now that is a Perhaps a psychological phenomenon is it? I'm not well acquainted enough with it to know. But it's a reality nonetheless. And that is a reflection in human life of what here the apostle urges us we need to do in a spiritual sense. To remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. It is bearing one another's burdens, of course. And there is a real sense in which it is impossible for you to detach yourself from your brothers and sisters in Christ like that, isn't it? People sometimes used to say to me when I was in New Mills, to be honest, I don't remember anybody saying it to me in St. George's Strawn, perhaps you're wiser, but they used to say to me uh, when I was in New Mills and going away on holiday, now, Mr. Alexander, when you go away on holiday, forget all about New Mills. And I used to laugh it off, I suppose. But, you know, if people are engraved on your heart and you live inside their lives, you can't forget them. And it ought not to be possible for us to detach ourselves from people. I think that's one of the differences between Christian bonds in Christ and every other kind of bond. There is a certain detachment that you may have in other spheres, but you cannot detach yourself from those who are your brothers and sisters in Jesus, can you? Any more than you could detach yourself from your human brother or sister or your human child. I'll go away on holiday and forget all about them because they're sick and if I get to the other side of the country, everything will be well. Of course, it's rubbish. You can't. You're inside where they are. And that's what Christian compassion is all about, beloved. That, of course, is the literal meaning of the words we use. Have you ever stopped to ask? It's important sometimes, I think, you know, to take hold of words that are always on our lips like sympathy and compassion. What's sympathy? Well, it's composed of two words, suffering and together with. Suffering together with. That's what sympathy is. Compassion is the same thing. It's suffering along with someone. And true compassion is that suffering together. Those who are ill-treated, says the apostle at the end of verse 3, as you are also in the body. That may refer to the body of Christ, and so we are members of the same body and suffer together, or rather more likely, I think, it means you also are in the flesh and liable to have the same kind of experience, and you will understand, therefore, what they are going through because you are a man as he is a man. And, of course, that is what the humanity of Jesus partly means to us, that he became a man like us men, so that he might sympathize with our weakness. The exercise of Christian brotherly love, the exercise of Christian hospitality, the exercise of Christian compassion. And you notice in verse 4, the fourth guideline is the exercise of Christian morality and Christian standards, particularly in relation to marriage and in life between the sexes generally. 
Now, you see, you can turn this whole list round about uh, right through and look at it in another way and say, if we are not running the race with our eyes upon Jesus all the time, then we will start wandering off these guidelines. Brotherly love will disappear. Christian hospitality and Christian compassion will be absent from our lives and from our midst if we are not running the race with our eyes on Jesus. And besides, these Christian standards in morality will also disappear and our view of Christian marriage will be devalued and dishonored. So says the Apostle, fourth guideline for running this race in practical terms, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the immoral and adulterous. Now in the authorized version, as I say in the reading, you have this as a statement instead of an exhortation. Marriage is honorable in all, but it should be read as an exhortation. An exhortation which arises, some people feel, because the apostle is protesting against some rather ascetic teaching which exalts celibacy. And so he is saying positively, marriage is honorable in all. There is no question about this. But it seems more likely that the emphasis is that we have to run the race through a world which has devalued and debased marriage and which exalts and almost glories in immorality and adultery. And we are to run the race in such a way that we honor and exalt marriage as a gift from God and recognize that adultery and immorality provoke God's righteous judgment. Now this is a very important guideline as it seems to me in a day when even for Christians the boundaries of Christian morality can so easily be blurred. We live in a society where this is happening and you cannot possibly live in a world where this kind of thing is being poured in upon you through the media, through television for example, when marriage is degraded and debased into a kind of contract of convenience which people regard rather lightly and as something of a joke in fact. A bond which can be intruded in with the greatest of ease. And where adultery is the common and smart thing to do amongst people. And where immorality before marriage, and these two words at the end of verse 4, of course refer to different things. Immoral and adulterous refers in the case of the first to immorality outside of marriage and the second to immorality inside marriage, that is to unfaithfulness. And I say to you, my dear Christian friends, none of us dare think we stand in this whole realm because there is a debasing of the marriage bond, a downgrading of marriage. Charles Haddon Spurgeon used to speak of the days when there was a downgrading of the gospel and of the doctrines which he had held dear. There is a downgrading of marriage in our day. And I think Christian people in our generation need by their example and by their lives to bear witness to the glories of the marriage bond as God has ordained it, to the beautiful thing that God has given to us in sexual relationships, and to say that sexual relationships are for marriage and for nowhere else but marriage. And that the marriage bond is so holy and sacred in the eyes of God that nothing may intrude into it. Beloved, we greatly need to bear witness to that. On the one hand, some of us need perhaps to be released from the idea 
that all sexual relationships are somehow or other doubtful and not very nice and that talking about that is itself a bit of a scandal. But on the other hand, some need to have it burned into their hearts and minds that sexual relationships of all kinds are for marriage and for marriage alone in the providence and purpose of God and to ignore that or devalue it is the high road to misery, not to freedom, but to bondage. Now, I think that's an important thing. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. I find that increasingly, even amongst Christian people in our day, there is a great difficulty often in being clear about precisely what the Christian doctrine of marriage and of relationships between the sexes is. I remember not so long ago at Keswick one year, Major Bill Batt, who many of you may have known as one of the great figures God raised up in certainly in my student generation, to be a blessing to many students, told me that he was spending all his week at Keswick from morning until night counseling members of Christian unions who had found themselves giving way to the pressures of the society in which they live in terms of the morality of their relationships. Now I say, we dare not say, tut, tut, how dreadful that is. Beloved, we need to say, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Because there is an area here where it's so easy for our minds to become conformed to the thinking of the world. And we need to bear witness to the holiness and beauty and glory and joy of the marriage bond. And if God has in his wisdom not seen fit to give you the blessing of the marriage bond, as yet, or even ever, you need to be persuaded that it is infinitely better to walk God's way outside of marriage than to walk your own way in marriage. Let marriage be held in honor. The exercise of Christian morality, however costly that may be, and I know that it is profoundly costly for many young people, and those of you who are older need to recognize with a great deal of love how very costly it is to walk this way in the modern world, and we desperately need to love and understand and pray for our younger brothers and sisters in this connection. The exercise of Christian contentment is the fifth and last of the guidelines we'll look at this evening. At least we've got halfway, nearly. Uh, verses 5 and 6. The New English Bible is very graphic when it translates, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. It says, do not live for money. Be content with what you have, for God himself has said, I will never leave you nor desert you. Now, in the metaphor of the Christian race, this is really touching, this whole question of Christian contentment on the issue of what we have our eyes on, ultimately. It is the prize that we are aiming for. And that's a very real issue when you're running a race, you see. What are you aiming for as the ultimate prize? What is the crown that you're running for? 
Now, we have to ask, are we in the race? In the light of the Apostles' exhortation, are we in the race to keep up with the Joneses? Or in what they call the rat race in our day? So easy to be diverted from the Christian race into the rat race, you know. And Paul echoes the same thought when he warns the love of money is the root of all evil. Keep your life free from the love of money, says the apostle. Now, I think it may be important to say here that the Christian contentment of which the apostle speaks and freedom from a love of money are quite compatible with a spirit of ambition to progress and to do well, for example, in one's job. That's a very important thing. Christian contentment is not alien to the idea of a man being ambitious to do his job as well as he can do it, and if he does, he probably will progress to become the very best that he can be for God in the place that God has set him down. And I think that's a very important principle for us to grasp. And it may well be that in the process of doing so, he may acquire a great deal of wealth. Now, it is not the acquiring of wealth that he is warning us against, but the love of it. And they are two different things that need to be distinguished. One of the biographies that I was reading in the summer, and I do commend it to you, is the biography of Sir John Lane, great figure in Carlisle amongst the brethren in his earlier days and the founder of the present uh, firm of Lane Construction which many of you will know about. Now, Sir John Lane was one of the most remarkable figures of his generation, a man of God who was utterly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ in his personal life. He was also a man of great business acumen, and he gave himself to his business, and God prospered and blessed him, and the business mushroomed and built up into the vast concern that it is today. And John Lane became a millionaire, at least once over. But you know, the amazing thing was that John Lane was totally untouched by money. He was totally unmoved by it. I'm not quite sure, but I rather think the book came from the library, so I couldn't look it up to be sure tonight. But I rather think that he left 300 pounds when he died. So much of his money had gone into trusts and into various different schemes and to various people. But Sir John Lane became a man of infinite wealth and yet of infinite contentment because he had avoided living for money. Now, the discontentment which a love of money often speaks of arises frequently from a deep-seated kind of insecurity. Have you ever thought of that? That very often the kind of discontentment and love of money which really masters some people's lives, and it can happen so subtly and gradually. One has seen the tragedy of it happening gradually, but it arises from a deep-seated sense of insecurity. And here are people seeking to make themselves secure with money. It was very interesting. Did you read in the paper about that man who won the pool some vast sum of money the other week. He won hundreds of thousands and at the thing after the six o'clock news before I went out one evening I saw him being interviewed and somebody said to him, one of these television interviewers that Malcolm Muggeridge makes such uh, moonshine of, he said to him, uh, now he said, what has this done for you? Will you? Could you tell us what this has done for your life? And he said, it has given me security. And I thought, ah, it's given me security, he said. 
Now, that was the man who died just the other day. Did you see that in the paper? Died just the other day. He had had it for weeks. It has given me security, he says. And the poor fool, for that's really what he was. He didn't know what he was talking about. Now, how is the Christian to run the race in this connection? First, he is to recognize that only God can ultimately satisfy his soul. He says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never fail you nor forsake you. There is where security lies, beloved. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you are a millionaire or a pauper, security lies for both men in the fact that God has covenanted himself never to leave and never to forsake us. Where did he say that? Well, the fact is he has said it again and again and again. Let me tell you some of the places. Genesis 28, 15, Deuteronomy 31, 8, Joshua 1, 8, 1 Chronicles 28, 20, Nehemiah 19, 17, and, thir and 31. It goes on and on and on. God is always saying this to his people, you see, simply because this is where their security lies. And he wants to woo us as his children away from all that so that we say, Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.